Welcome. Welcome to this Nestle webinar hosted in partnership with Innovation Forum. I'm Ian Welsh. We're going to be talking about regenerative agriculture for the next 90 minutes or so. Some quick housekeeping points before we get started. This session will be recorded to so ensure that anyone who isn't able to join us live can listen to the discussions afterwards and we'll be sharing links to the content after the webinar. We want the session to be as interactive as possible, so please do be thinking about your questions throughout the webinar and sub submit them using the Q&A function on Zoom. We will put your questions to the speakers and panelists as part of the dedicated Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. Please try and keep questions as concise as possible to ensure that we are able to get through as many as possible. You can make them for a specific participant and do like the questions from others uh, that you want to be asked as that will push them up the rankings. Now we're anticipating a lot of questions, so to help get through as many as possible, members of the Nestle team will be answering some of them live by text. Now we're going to hear uh, shortly from some of the Nestle team, followed by a couple of regenerative agricultural case studies, a panel discussion, and then uh, audience Q&A. Before we get started though, I thought just a few pieces of context might be helpful. In late 2020, Nestle made a commitment to source 20% of its key ingredients from regenerative agriculture by, 2020, by 2025 and 50% by 2030. Now, of course, we're in 2023 now and the company is starting to report on its progress. And today we'll learn about some of the projects underway in different parts of the world and hear from other experts on the key challenges for implementing Regen Ag at scale throughout the food industry. Okay. Uh, let me turn over now to Rob Cameron, who's Vice President, Global Head of Public Affairs and ESU Engagement at Nestle, for a few words of welcome. Rob. Great. Thanks, Ian. Thanks very much indeed for the introduction and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, it's an important topic. It couldn't be more important in, in my eyes. The Some people will tell us that the transition that's underway on regenerative agriculture is the biggest transition in agriculture for over 100 years. Um, and from our point of view, we just see it as so fundamental to our climate journey that we're on, and not exclusively the climate journey. There's so much more to regenerative agriculture than, than, than climate. It embraces, obviously, biodiversity, uh, soil health, and so much more, which we'll hear. Now, this is a global effort from our point of view, but of all the topics um, in which we're engaged, it's the one in which local context matters so much. So too, in that local context, does it matter that we're listening to farmers? And I'm particularly glad that we have some farmers with us on the call today, and we're gonna hear from them later on. So I particularly want to add a word of welcome uh, to them. I also want to say a word, word of welcome to those uh, joining the call who are working on the measurement and metrics piece of this, because it's an inexact science. It is not binary. There is no one size fits all approach on regenerative agriculture. And figuring out the way forward Forward on the metrics, I think, is really, really important to us. So I think that's something we might get into later on as well. So with that, and without further ado, I'd just like to open the uh, the session, thank Innovation Forum for pulling us all together, uh, and hand it over to, back to you, Ian, and then I think we're going to Pascal. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Rob. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to be joined now by Pascal Chapeau, who's Group Head of Sustainable Agricultural Development at Nestle. Welcome, Pascal. Hey, there we are. Excellent, it does work. Excellent, welcome, Pascal. So, um, for Nestle then, um, what is regenerative, regenerative, regenerative agriculture? It's hard even to see it. Um, what is regenerative agriculture and why is it important? Look, what it is, um, in a few words, because we could spend uh, hours, but it's, a, it's an approach to farming for us based on agroecological principles that aims to protect and restore the farmland and its ecosystem and the main resources needed in agriculture, meaning soil, water, biodiversity, and all this uh, while supporting farming as a business, uh, its development and its resilience. And today we, we put a lot of focus and emphasize on soil health and soil fertility, and also we really want to see it as an outcome based, uh, you know, as much as possible. We, we, we go for impact. Uh, now, a uh, question uh, to the why. Uh, main reason is, you know, we are a food company. So uh, whichever product that reaches a consumer, 
as a farmer in the field at, uh, at the beginning of its life. So, uh, you know, agriculture, it's in Nestle's DNA. Uh, it's been for decades, but today even more than, than before. And the second, one of the second why it's the greenhouse gas. Uh, agriculture um, has a role to play. It represents uh, roughly two thirds of our, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gas footprint. So it, it needs to, to be addressed. Uh, and last, uh, but, but not least of the why, it's uh, agriculture is often seen and presented as a problem, but we're, we do believe, we're convinced that it can be part and it has to be part of the solution. Uh, you know, we managed today to, to feed, uh, you know, uh, 3 billion more than uh, 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, there has been some problems. It has created no soil, uh, water uh, shortage sometimes. All this needs to be addressed. And, and uh, we must go for this transition. Okay, thanks very much. Now, um, what then are your regenerative, regenerative agricultural commitments and achievements to date? I think we've got a couple of slides for that. Um, look, so commitment, I think Rob uh, mentioned it. So it's this uh, 20% by uh, 2030 and 50 by 2050. Uh, but this is the, the, the quick answer. I think I will spend more time on what have we achieved uh, today, which I think very, very important. Uh, one number um, last year, end of last year, so we, we, we measured that we had reached uh, a six, six percent uh, sourced from you know, farmers engaged in the, in the transition to regenerative practices. And I think uh, beyond that number, uh, I would like to go uh, a little bit deeper, you know, in the granularity, uh, because this is where, to me, the, the, the real uh, meat, uh, the, the, the real meat is. Uh, today, I'm very happy to share, to have this opportunity, because I remember two years ago, we had a similar event, and I was presenting our plans. Today, uh, I can, you know, I'm very proud of the work, uh, you know, performed and carried out by all our teams, because I can say today that in fresh milk, the 27 markets, they have all embarked, you know, with uh, regenerative uh, agriculture initiatives. Coffee, we have more than uh, 10 origins, 10 countries as well in direct sourcing. Cocoa, the income accelerator and the cocoa plant there. The, the embed uh, regenerative practices. We have big projects on, on cereals as well. You know, I could quote a lot like that. We, we, we run last year uh, more than 4,000 farm assessments uh, and we use the cool farm tool to compute uh, the carbon impact. Uh, we get also tangible uh, results, you know, tangible impact on many, many projects. So you can move maybe to the next slide uh, just to, 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 to illustrate how it looks like, you know, in all these categories, uh, very, you know, very technically, uh, but I guess this is not the point, but we took a few pictures uh, just to illustrate, uh, you know, what we do across the world. So you can see cover crops in, in Poland, that's agroforestry in coffee in India, which is a key a key element and very strong. I was there two months ago, it's fantastic what we have there. Uh, lots of peer-to-peer -peer training, uh, biodigester in dairy, uh, pasture management systems. So all these are things that we are scaling up today. And uh, I think we can be proud of the, the job done in all our direct sourcing. And again, to give you an idea of the scale, these are you know more than 30 countries. Last year, we launched last year uh, the research side, the Nestle Institute of Ag Agriculture Science. Uh, where we run uh, lots of very important research projects. So the, the, the research agenda is very important. And I was this morning in the dairy research farm where we run, um, you know, project on feed additives, manure management, uh, feed efficiency. So there are a lot of things uh, in the pipe as well for the future. Great, and thank you. Um, so you obviously you've made some progress, um, but Clearly, there's a, a lot to do. So, in general terms, uh, where are you finding the biggest challenges to date? Um, look, first of all, what I would like to quote is that uh, a positive thing, which is the model that we had set two years ago, is correct. You know, the main pillars, the main resources, the main levers are correct, and meaning that we will keep pushing on that. Doesn't mean that we control everything. Uh, uh, we have we face a lot of challenges. Um, 
over there is a first one for us, which is the, the diversity, you know, the, the size and the breadth of Nestle operations. You know, we 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 go from uh, small dairy holders in Pakistan to a large size uh, farm in Brazil on cereals. So that, that's a real complexity. And for us, it's a, it's a key challenge. Uh, but overall, I would quote farmers' engagement as a very important point. It's key to engage and embark farmers, and this takes time. It takes resources, not only money, but people expertise. Um, it's also important to see all this as a, as a transition. This is change management, and in that change, farmers' income is absolutely paramount. You know, if there is no benefit for the farmer, nothing will happen. We said it two years ago, we can only repeat it and strengthen it today. We must work together with farmers. And this is also what takes time. And, and then I would say um, uh, smallholders, it's a challenge because uh, we still need to find how to address them in the best way because we need to also uh, address them in a specific manner uh, to, to make sure that we help them develop, but we cannot address them in the same way we will address uh, you know, a, a large size uh, farm in the uh, in US. And I could quote many other, I think also the, 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 the metrics, you know, the data collection is something, Rob mentioned it, it's difficult. We need it, we want to measure things, we want to measure impact, but it's extremely heavily resource consuming. And this is a new area. So there, we need more development, uh, more development there. Great, well, we can perhaps come and consider some of those challenges a little bit later uh, in, the, in the webinar. Now, we're going to hear from some specific areas of success shortly, but are there any, any other ingredient specific progress you'd like to highlight at this stage? I think the, you, you will hear now two detailed, more, more details for a coffee and a dairy project. But so what I would like to say is that I think overall in dairy, I'm quite happy with the progress done. We have a roadmap. Uh, for these 27 countries, which represent something like uh, 6 billion liters of, uh, of milk. So, so that's quite a sizable operation. Coffee, agroforestry is developing super well with intercropping. Uh, we have now a, a good transparency. We're, I'm able to say that, you know, in this market, our intercropping rate is that much. And, and we see it growing with good results. Uh, and Rock will detail more. Uh, and, and there are a few projects which uh, I would like to quote. I was mentioning this um, living soil project in France on cereals where we, we built uh, a very nice soil framework to characterize soil health. And I was there two, day, two, day, two days ago. Uh, farmers are happy. It delivers, you know, tangible improvements. So we are on the right way. And, and, and there, for instance, uh, that, that means 200 farmers, uh, something like 15,000 hectares impacted, you know, 24 kilometers of hedgerows planted. So real, real stuff. Um, I would like to quote back to dairy also. Uh, we are coming now with pricing scheme. It, it, we include in the price component in what we pay to farmers, some incentive on regenerative practices. Uh, so this is a strong lever and it helps a lot uh, where we have it. And this, we, we have it growing. Um, yeah, so I could quote a lot, uh, a lot of projects. I could quote uh, a larger partnership that we signed in US as well on on, on cereals, where we we have uh, you know big volumes of cereals impacted. So uh, you, you know we we could quote a lot. I'm happy to to give more details, but we are moving strong now. Uh, we have built a strong basis, uh, and we are now really in the in the in the upscaling phase which will bring its own challenges. Um, but I think we, yeah, we, we are making a strong move and solid move, I would say. So I could tell okay. many okay. more, but I will leave it to Ngok and uh, Gabriela, who are the, the real experts today and, and farmers. Great, though, no, indeed. As I said, lots more we can come back to a bit later in the, in the session. Thank you. Loads of questions coming in already, which is terrific. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can a little bit later on in the webinar. All right, um, we're going to turn now to uh, a couple of case studies. First of all, we're in a case study uh, dairy farming in Chile, and I'm delighted to be joined by Gabriela Guarda from Nestle Chile and by Natalie uh, Ur Urutia 
from Agriculture Research Institute INIA. Um, welcome to you both. So, Natalie, uh, can I ask you to just get us started by giving us some context to the dairy sector in Chile in terms of its size and its impact? Natalie. Good morning. Thanks, Ian. Um, well, the, the dairy industry in Chile, the dairy farms, um, I'd say around 70% of them are located in, in the southern region of Chile. That is where um, uh, most of the, like the dairy farms are, are based on uh, grazing practices. Are, um, we aren't a, a, a country that produces so um, so, uh, so, so much milk as, as other dairy countries, but this region, the southern part of Chile specifically, um, concentrated in, 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 in dairy farms. It's a very important economical sector for the region, and, and that's um, represented around uh, 5,000 heads of, of dairy cattle um, to date. Hey, thanks very much indeed. So. Um, what sort of uh, regenerative agricultural practices are, are being introduced into the sector in Chile? Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to mention that the dairy farms in the southern region of Chile uh, have already a lot of practices of regenerative agriculture uh, in their farms, in their management practices. Um, of course, a lot of them need improvement and more specific or more um, um, efficiency in the use of some some of these practices but uh, we are using it's been used for a long time uh, it needs to be adopted in, in, in a greater um, part of the dairy farms uh, what is the use of cover crops for seasonal uh, forage um, in the fields uh, also manure uh, fertilization of lands with manure that is a practice that is commonly done here in, in the dairy farms and south of, um, and grazing dairy farms. However, uh, a lot of this uh, fertilization with manure is, is not very balanced. It's usually the farmer is used to um, practice this management, but it's not uh, based on um, nutrient composition analysis of the manure. So uh, part of the work that we're doing with Nestlé is um, teaching the farmers to, in, uh, to, to read these nutrient um, composition analysis and then be able to calculate how much chemical fertilization they could apply on, on farms, on the fields, sorry. Okay, no, thanks very much indeed. Uh, nice, thank you for that overview. Gabriela, let me uh, bring you in now. Um, what are the benefits then that uh, your farmers are finding from the region agri practices? Good day, everyone. Well, um, we have different um, benefits for the farmers. One uh, is the uh, Pascal also already mentioned. We have bonuses on our payment scheme to help them go through um, the different Region Act projects. Um, we also are giving them uh, continuous support with our agri teams in the fields. And also, as Natalie is joining us today from INIA, we have a strong support from the government also through our partnership with them. And also, as, as the main uh, agriculture um, development is a family-oriented uh, work, we are also engaging uh, young people and training through scholarships also. So those are the main benefits that we're working on together. And also, we have um, suppliers and technology companies, so the farmers can obtain better uh, better financial conditions to obtain technology. Okay, thank you. Um, so key challenges then, what are they uh, in Chile and how have you addressed these? Well, um, as Pascal also mentioned, this is a transition and also is uh, a non one size fits all. So we have to understand that we have different uh, uh, size of, of farmers and therefore the challenges, um, I believe that 
uh, tr gain trust and the, that trust that we want to gain with our farmers is um, securing science-based results. That is why it's in, super important to have this uh, collaborative work with INEA that depends on the M Ministry of Agriculture, with uh, Austral University, having academia and research projects and uh, helping our farmers uh, with technical support. I believe that, that those are the main challenges for, for our farmers today. Okay. Um can you give me a bit then uh, a context to the partnership that you've developed with the Institute um, and how you want to scale this further? Okay, um, we develop an agreement of partnership because uh, everything is science-based. So we have to develop a lot of research as Natalie said, um, for cover crops or for manure fertilization to support our farmers. Of course, we have to, to teach them and give the best practices. We are running different kinds of projects uh, on manure management, biofertilization, cover crops uh, and, and different action so having them as a partner is really uh, supportive to the farmers great okay well uh, thank you very much indeed um for taking a solo of that it's been really interesting finding out more about the the work in in chile um audience if you have any specific questions for um gabriella and natalie they'll be joining us in the q a session so any specific questions on what you've heard there um they'll be they'll be delighted to take the question a little bit later on. But for now, thanks very much indeed. Um, let me turn now to um, our second case study, case study, which we're looking at uh, coffee in Vietnam. And I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Mr. Pham Phu Nok, who's the Agro Service Manager at Nestle Vietnam. Welcome to you. Now, uh, Nestle's uh, Nescafe plan has been delivering benefits in Vietnam for 10 years or so now. So, what have been the most significant areas of progress? I know you've got some slides to demonstrate these. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, today I'm very happy and also very proud to on behalf of Medley Vietnam, especially an agronomist of Nescafe Plan and more than 21,000 farmers in uh, under Nescafe Plan Vietnam to tell you a story about the ruin of the reusable agriculture. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, you know that when we carry out the reactive agriculture in coffee under NACAFE plan, actually, we have so many challenges uh, in the beginning. Especially, you know that the farmer already long time did many different sustainable coffee development program before. So that's why they are lost in the trust from the existing coffee uh, development program. And uh, together with that, uh, you know that the coffee in Vietnam actually long last for some uh, coffee plantation more than 100 years, 60 years, and mostly over 20 years. So that's why we got the big issue on the Asian coffee plantation together with the raw and also the water socket. So that's why you can see on the picture, even very small, but uh, the farmer try to dig the very deep well, try to get water for irrigation. And uh, the, traditionally, the farmers also have the habit to picking the uh, green cherry rather than the red cherry. The, the, the reason why, because you see, normally during the harvest season, the coffee price very high. So that's why the farmer try to picking the green cherry and try to do the semi hurling in order to suck out the time for rain and catch up the good price. And since it's completely very bad practice, uh, need to be improved uh, and lead to the poor coffee quality. And uh, you know that uh, when the farmer picked in the uh, green cherry, so they already lost about 20% of their production. So that's why when we carry out the benefit plan, we focus on the many different uh, aspects. Uh, firstly, we incorporate the richer uptake of sustainable uh, practice based on policy corporate conduct. Then by that, we uh, implement the uh, visualization, water saving irrigation, intercropping practice. Actually, this one under roots agriculture practice and NECAFE better farming practice have been introduced since we start NECAFE plan in Vietnam. 
then uh, in this case, you see the family has the enough knowledge and they know how to begin the rib cherry rather than the, the green cherry like before. And this one automatically improves the puppy quality. And also the family already uh, received the, the, the extra income. Uh, like I mentioned, they lost 20% of the uh, green cherry, then now ribbon cherry, they already received 20% on that one. Next slide, please. Then uh, in order to do so, we have the resort, and you can see that actually uh, in Net Cafe Plan in Vietnam, we have very light organization. We have only S agronomics, and each one will be responsibility for each four C units. Uh, and you can see that uh, more than 31,000 farmers, uh, more than 34,000 hectare coffee, and every year we can go deal around 150,000 uh, 150, tons of foresee coffee. Then uh, we base on more than 274 farmer group leaders who have been together with our army to transfer the knowledge uh, to the farmer in the partnership with different organizations, like you can see on the, the screen, IDS, FOSC, Global Coffee Platform, ILO, Pro ICR, MAS, and AC, WASC, CIRAC, and BCCB. So I think this one, uh, some uh, the term, the terminology is very long, but uh, mostly they are focused on agriculture activity and focus on the, the, the coffee, most likely. And uh, like Bascan already mentioned about the uh, reusable agriculture practice, actually, when we transfer the knowledge to the farmer, if you keep the, the term, the original economic term, and the farmer are very worried. So that's why we try to sum up in three main different uh, aspects. Firstly, on soil conservation and soil health. Uh, actually, this one we focus more on the how to improve the soil fertility. Uh, the indicator you know, when we talk to the farmer, uh, if you go to the field and you see the soil with a lot of uh, earthworm and a lot of uh, carbon, uh, like munching, uh, so that means uh, the soil uh, in the good uh, set. The second one on the water and water conservation, actually this one is very important for the farmer. And we focus more on the water saving irrigation because you see in Vietnam, Coffee is irrigated coffee. And the farmer normally they are using a lot of water for irrigation. And that, that's why for water conservation, we focus more on the how to reduce water for irrigation in the rubber. And uh, last but not least, we focus on biodiversity. Then uh, biodiversity also, uh, when talking about diversity, also very difficult for the farmer to understand. So that's why we bring back to the farmer, we said to the farmer, well, do you know where coffee comes from? And they know that actually the coffee comes from the jungle forest. So that's why when we plant coffee under the genetic agriculture practice, so that means we bring back the nature to coffee as much as possible. Then uh, the, the good uh, signal for the, the good environment for the red uh, agri practice is when you go to the field and you see a lot of earthworm and a lot of butterfly during, during the, the, the season. So that is a good signal for, uh, for the, the good coffee plantation. Next slide, please. And uh, in summary, you can see that until now, uh, Net Cafe Plan already have more than 21,000 beneficiary. And also adding on top of that one, every year we also work together with more than 50,000 farmers uh, for the plant lab distribution. Uh, after more than um, 10 years, actually 12 years already, and we already carried out nearly more than 3,000 transactions uh, and participants for, from the farmer's side. And uh, we also distribute more than 63 million roots lead uh, toilet and high yield coffee plant uh, plantation, uh, planted to distribute to uh, the farmer until the last August 2020. And uh, we also introduced the uh, related agriculture uh, to promotion of intercropping model uh, and also integrated with management. Uh, what about the impact? You know that uh, through the end of every year, we, we have the uh, um, monitoring and evaluation by Vampire Lion and uh, by the distribute of uh, more than 33 million of planted. That means we already support the farmer to rejuvenate or renovate more than 
33,000 hectares of coffee plantation. And 90% of the farmer using uh, the cover cropping. And uh, you know that on most of the plant, uh, the farmer has seen the, using the cover fertilizer to improve the soil fertility. And also to increase the yield uh, every year. Uh, you know that now, uh, some case, the, the yield up increase from 21 up to 100%. And 60% uh, of the cocky grow in that cafe plant have the secretary. And the farmer also try to prioritize on the mechanized within and using munching. So that means they reduce and uh, in the future, they not using any herbicide for within. Next, uh, next slide, please. And in this case, you see, we deliver more genetic landscape. So that means we shift from the monoculture, monocropping to intercropping or crop diversity. And you can see this is the picture in Nectafe plant farm in Vietnam. And uh, Baskan already visited us and uh, on this farm. Less likely. Then, then you can see that's uh, this is the side you can see on the net of plant side where the coffee very well uh, developed together with intercropping tree. Then uh, that is the, the, the last message I would like to uh, give to you. And thank you so much for your listening. Great. No, thank you so much. Um, it's a really impressive uh, numbers there. I mean, picked up 63 million coffee plants uh, distributed. That's a, a lot of coffee plants for sure. Um, now, uh, listeners, uh, audience, if you have any questions specifically uh, for Mr. Nock, then please do be putting them into the Q&A. Um, we've already had quite a lot of questions, and I see uh, a significant number of them have been answered by the Nestle team um, as we've been going along. So thanks for those, and uh, thanks again to you, Mr. Nock. Right, um, we're going to move now to uh, a panel discussion for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome back Pascal for, from Nestle, um, and I'm also joined by Stefania Avanzini from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development by Philippe Berker, who's uh, with Climate Farmers, and uh, Ian Matz, who's with Bricksworth Farming. So welcome to all of you. Um, I'm going to have a chat with uh, Stefania, Ian and Philippe for, for a while. And then, Pascal, I'll bring you in at the end to perhaps give a kind of Nestle perspective on how things are going to go forward. Um, so reflecting on the case studies that we've heard then, and, and more broadly, what panel do you think are the uh, or do you see it as the principal challenges for farmers in developing a regenerative approach? Uh, Stefania. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much for inviting us. So I'm Stefania Vancini. I work for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And for those who don't know, just a quick introduction, it's a CEO-led community of leading businesses that are working, working together to transform change. And as Rob was referring to in the beginning, the agricultural transformation and really moving probably from a degenerative to a regenerative production system is one of the most systemic shifts and exciting shifts that we're seeing. And we're also seeing probably different ambitions, different, different level of ambitions, different initiatives, different farming systems that are being adopted. And as a consequence, there is a fragmented landscape and probably also an overhaul of information for the farmers. So one of the key um, levers that we see in key opportunities to scale regenerative agriculture is how can we harmonize a global set of metrics where we would that we would measure and reward farmers for? So which environmental outcomes do we want to reward farmers for? This is probably the first key systemic shift that we see that needs to happen so that the transition, so we know what success looks like. The second one, very important one that was mentioned is the farmer economic case. We, we today, def, different studies show that there is a positive long-term economic case for, for farmers who have adopted regenerative farming practices, but the transition costs are still way too much and their, and their risks are way too much on the shoulders of the farmers. And so how can we support the farmers in de-risking the farmer's transition? This is a very important, uh, I think, lever that we need to actually up, up, up this, the uptake this, uh, the farmer engagement. And then I, I, th I thought it was shown also beautifully in these case studies that we have seen um, the peer-to-peer -peer learning. So knowledge 
uh, agriculture is very place specific and so non agronomic knowledge to implement uh, efficient regenerative farming systems need to be at, at, a, at a local level and so how can we actually develop the the, the relevant peer-to-peer -peer learning networks that need to happen the demo farms that also Nestle was mentioning or the, um, the networks of ambassadors and I think probably our two uh, my two other panelists will, will talk about that what I want to probably highlight, because that's where my organization is mostly focusing their work, and I just want to highlight that there is advancements here, and it's it's on the first uh, it, it's really on the first lever I was I was mentioning, which is what what success looks like, or how we, do we want to reward farmers, uh, and 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 how do you want to reward and measure environmental outcomes for farmers? And here I want to highlight two important uh, initiatives that are taking place. Uh, where I would like everyone to invite. One is a very important one. It's a multi-stakeholder coalition called Region 10, where, where different uh, organizations are coming together to really uh, try to answer the questions. What would it take for 50% of the of food system to be produced regeneratively by, 20, by 2030? So it's a, it's a very ambitious coalition uh, where where the World Farmers Organization, IUCN, the Meridian Institute, also WBCSD, Leaders Quest, are present and, and systemic, uh, and and we're and there. One of the main pillars of action is also how can we actually develop uh, um, um, a framework with a global set of metrics that is adapt, adopted by farmers. And on that front, I also wanted to highlight some work that we're doing actually in house. We are really committed to. Within, within by participating in this initiative in, in two years to really drive widespread industry alignment and adoption on my, on on a global set of metrics and so how can also corporates align on the way they measure report and disclose uh, on these metrics and this also re reflects the work that the uh, the second challenge that uh, that uh, that was mentioned here it's it's about also how do we uh, account for it for for our to to achieve a net zero for example economy uh, so if you are in, if you're a company, if you're interested to join, don't hesitate to contact us on this point. And I can I can drop it also in the chat. I just wanted to mention that some alignment has already happened. Uh, and um, and uh, the the one planet business for biodiversity, which is an action oriented coalition of, of companies who have already all committed to transition to regenerative agriculture has actually already aligned in 2021. On, on four principles and eight impact indicators. So there is already some work out there. Some alignment is already there. Now we just need, where I feel the status is, how do we now drive widespread industry alignment? And on the farmer economics either, as, as Pascal was mentioning, what important, many companies have understood the importance of incentivizing the transition. And for example, through price premiums and banks through preferential loans, some instruments are already out there. We have published recently with PCG a study that, that is showing that Probably the financial instruments are already out there, but how do we actually coordinate them? Because today for the farmer, it's an overhaul of information. How do I get access to it? And especially how do we concentrate them, as I was saying, at the first transition where there is this gap probably in productivity and that that, you, that needs to be compensated and that the farmer cannot risk, uh, bear, uh, bear alone on his shoulders. Um, that would be it. I, I can post then in the chat some of the links, and I'm looking forward to some um, to share more of my reflections in the Q and A. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Now, um, I want to come back to metrics, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and uh, economic case a little bit later in the discussion. But thanks very much for for setting it out so clearly. Um, Philippe, can you uh, think about um, some some of your thoughts on my, my initial question, though? Principal challenges for farmers in developing a regenerative approach. What do you what do you see for as terms of the principal challenges? Sure, happy to jump in. Yeah, I think a disclaimer that I should say is with climate farmers, we are supporting farmers across Europe in the transition to regenerative agriculture. So everything that I'm saying is specific for the European context, I would say. I don't think I'm not sure if it applies to other regions. Uh, in Europe, we're doing this since 2019. We're working with around 700 farmers. Um, and it was very interesting to see the, the hype around regenerative agriculture and to see all these amazing commitments to region ag produce, but I don't see the risk being shifting. And this is, I think, what Stefania was touching upon as well. And what I see as the key issue that we're having is that everybody wants farmers to transition towards regenerative agriculture, but they're still left alone with the risk that that transition brings for them, which includes crop loss, which includes the costs that they're having, especially in the first two years. And unless that risk is shifted from the farmer's shoulders to the shoulders of society, 
and of the corporates which have an interest in sourcing region produce, we will not see the transition at scale happening that we all want to see. Farmers in the European Union are on average in their 50s and people in their 50s tend to be rather risk averse. So the farmers that we are working with and that we see as doing the transition is either the ones which are desperate and which are in critical situations where they have to do something or which are young and idealistic, so they're willing to taste the risk with them. But if we want to make that transition at large happen, we need to shift the financial and the general risk of the transition from the farmer's shoulders to the shoulders of those that benefit from it through the ecosystem services that the farmers will be providing for all of us. Great, no, thanks very much. Um, some points there that um, we can pick up on for sure. Um, and you know, the ecosystem services piece is always very interesting and we can come back to that too. Ian, uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, thanks for your patience. So same question to you, what are you seeing as the principal challenges for farmers in developing a regenerative approach? Um, well, thank you very much for having me on here. Um, my background again is a little different. So I, I farm in the UK, uh, in Northamptonshire, we're cereal farmers. So um, a slightly different context, maybe, but listening to the presentations, very similar, um, yeah, unsurprisingly, very similar sort of approaches. So we've looked um, towards farming more regeneratively over the last sort of seven years now, and it wasn't an ideolo ideological sort of view to, to head towards that route. It was things that were causing us problems on the ground. So for us in particular, it was, it was challenges with grass weeds. It was black grass in particular. And that all comes down to effectively soil health. And, and, and our route into regenerative farming is very much targeted at trying to improve soil health. And the problem is, I've heard the word transition a lot uh, over the last sort of half an hour. And I guess the problem for farms is we don't really know what that transition is. We don't know how long it is. It's going to be different for every farm. Uh, and as has already been highlighted, there's a lot of costs and a lot of risks involved in, in that in achieving that end game, which we don't know when we're going to get there. Um, uh, and I suppose fundamentally that, that's the problem. And it's it's um, it, it would be a lot easier for us to almost bury our head in the sand and, and carry on as normal and accept some of the minor risks that we face continuing as we have been, rather than investing in things where we're really sort of going back to the drawing board in some respects and trying to trying to learn again, trying to start from scratch. Um, and agriculture is such a slow process that the learnings are slow and our ability to implement them take a long time. Uh, and the outcomes can be affected by things that are outside of our control, like the weather. So it, it takes such a long time period that, as I said, I think, you know, the, the idea of sort of support for some of these uh, some of these practices uh, really sits well with me because I think if we can share the risk, it won't necessarily drive people to look at doing things differently, but it certainly could help to accelerate that rate of change. That's great. No, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Stefania, let me turn back to you briefly. Then um, uh, alignment and metrics. How can this best be done? You touched on this before, but what are the key things for you on aligning on the metrics? Well, so what is what is it definitely important here is how do we align on the way we measure, report, and also then reward farmers for? So the, what is the, why do we need this alignment on metrics? Is we need this, and why do that, does this alignment need to be across, not only across the co corporates, but with farmers and also multi-stakeholders? We're also talking then about about uh, public by policymakers, it is important that we have an aligned approach because if if not, we won't. This transition won't be able to happen at scale, and most importantly, if this does not happen at uh, across sectors, then also the the road to valorization. And as we were talking, for example, for the rewarding farmers for the environmental services that they're providing by becoming also stewards of our lands and not only producers of the essential foods and fibers they're producing. And um, this can only happen if we actually are aligning on the outcomes. So the first step is let's align on the environmental outcomes we want to measure and we think are key to measure the, this global set of metrics. And then, then we can then shift to how do we valorize it? And the, and the financial sector and the private sector can definitely go for it. A, a concrete example where there is st today strong consensus uh, where there is increasing consensus, I would say, would be uh, on the soil, uh, on, will be on carbon. 
So how do we, how, because it's a unit of measure uh, on the carbon sequestrated in the soil and, 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 and how, and you, we can see today also in the year of an emerging market on, on carbon credits, which still needs to be improved. And, 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 and this is why there is also legislations on carbon certification removals that, that is being set up at the EU level. So this is still not a perfectly efficient market, but this shows that this is moving in the right direction. And we have seen also a lot of interest and emerging initiatives on biodiversity. And we can imagine that different other indicators um, and level of maturity will, will emerge also for, for soil health, for water, and ultimately also for farmer, farmer livelihoods. Thanks very much. Um, Philip, Philip, the same question to you then. For you, what are you seeing in terms of where, where we have to align to get these you know, metrics correct? Um, and how can this best be done? I think the, the, the crucial thing or the crucial issue that I see here is that as very often, unfortunately, in this conversation, a lot of these metrics and these frameworks seem to be developed without farmers part of that discussion. So what we are using uh, with the farmers that we are working with is a, what we call a farm health scorecard that we develop together with our farmer community. In that farmer scorecard, we don't only focus on carbon, but we focus on um, ecological regeneration of the farm, economical regeneration of the farm. How can farmers become more profitable again? Because lower and lower profit margins for farmers are a massive part of the issue. And also personal regeneration of farmers. I believe one of the massive issues that we're having in Europe is that it's simply not attractive to be a farmer nowadays. In my generation, many farms have ended because many young people are not interested in becoming farmers anymore because being a farmer is not a very regenerative job right now. It's a very stressful job. It's a very intense job. It's very intense working hours. Most of the time, not even the option of holidays. And unless we start working on having farmers living a life that is a regenerative life and an enjoyable life, we will not be able to make it more attractive for farmers to get into farming. And then we will run into massive issues in the next 10 to 20 years with all of these farmers in their 50s going into retirement. So first of all, we need to put farmers at the forefront of the table and we need to discuss with farmers what they need in order to be able to regenerate their soil and their own livelihood. Thank you. And Ian, for you, uh, wheat farmer in the UK, what are your uh, thoughts on the sort of metrics that need to be aligned upon and what will be useful for you? Uh, I, th I think this is probably the hardest aspect um, of, uh, of this whole conversation, really, is you know, a lot of what we're doing um, is probably aimed at, as we said, carbon and biodiversity. But you know, we, we've started looking at soil organic matter. We've, we've been taking measurements since 2016. And, and, there's, and there's a lot of variability. There's a lot of variation across fields. Uh, it depends on what, which labs you send it to. It depends which tests are taken. So trying to, get, trying to get good, really good measurements, I understand how important it is, but I think that's also a really big challenge in itself because uh, it, it can end up being sort of overcomplicated uh, and ideally that that burden doesn't want to be put back onto the farm so I don't specifically have an answer but but I think that's the sort of thing which really needs uh, as has already been discussed that really needs sort of outlining from the start so that farms know what they're getting involved in they know what they what they're sort of setting themselves up for because as we said that the, the reasons why we've entered is uh, is to help reduce our unit cost of productions um, there is this cost and risk involved where we're looking at sort of help and support for that, um, then obviously we've got to be able to show some some sort of changes. Um, but you know that, that to me at the moment that seems um, seems one of the biggest unknowns as to how we actually report on that. Okay, I guess possible solution to help here might be the sort of peer to peer learning uh, examples that we've talked about. Stefania, so, do you have any more to add about that? What does good peer to peer learning look like here? In my, probably my two other panelists will ha, will be able to answer best this question. But what I can say and attest is, from uh, we 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 collected more than sixty case studies out of uh, twenty of our most engaged and advanced members that are implementing regenerative agriculture, and all of them said their key success factor for implementing their the regenerative farming practices at scale in their region was to develop a peer-to-peer -peer learning for a network, was to have demo farms or a group of farmers that are, were the ambassadors and that actually allowed to be also the knowledge sharer uh, of, of the program. So this is definitely a, a key success factor, I would say, where a key component 
when when in, when designing and, and and trying to scale up regenerative agricultural projects. Uh, I would leave it then to Philippe and Ian to explain how exactly they feel, uh, how you get those those um, farmers on board and how you actually then scale it up. Okay, thanks, Stefania. Philippe then, um, how for you have you been uh, encouraging peer-to-peer -peer learning with the farmers that you work with and what are the key keys to getting it right? Um, this is an interesting one because it's, it's almost uh, it's almost a no-brainer because the very interesting thing is in the very beginning, being a good old tech startup, we tried to over-engineer everything. So we came with all these fancy platforms like Mighty Networks and like Slack and so on. In the end, what's working best is WhatsApp. Farmers have WhatsApp. Every farmer that I ever met has WhatsApp. Um, and farmers like to support each other and to help each other. So we have regional um, and topic-specific WhatsApp groups, which are moderated by farmers. Um, which have, and this is one of my biggest pleasures of my job, is being in these WhatsApp groups and seeing the messages like ding, 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 just coming in. And questions are, I would say, answered within one or two hours by farmers to the other farmers. Um, as part of that, what we're also doing is we're doing farm visits. So we're organizing farms, uh, farm visits for farmers on uh, regenerative farms, which is also being very well received. And we just started rolling out a farm mentor program with amazing success where farmers who are more advanced on the regenerative paths are mentoring other less advanced farmers for free without any payment for it, just because they want to and they love to share their knowledge. So I think it's an amazing thing. Uh, this is not the part I think where society needs to over-engineer to interact. Farmers support each other by themselves. We just need to give them the basics. Much more important is the topics that we have touched upon before, as we mentioned, uh, the risk reduction for farmers and the financial support, um, because farmers will be supporting each other no matter what. Okay, thank you. Pascal, you wanted to come in. Yes, I wanted to comment on this peer-to-peer, -peer, which is, I'm all for it. And uh, this is the best way, if not the way for a farmer, you know, to adopt practices. And it's always the same way. There is one or two pioneers in an area and people look at that and, and they need to be, to see the result, to be convinced. It's just human. I just wanted to, to, to comment that based on that, uh, we have created and started uh, a Facebook uh, platform, uh, which we are localizing. The, the idea for us is to create local communities, you know, dairy farm, Nestle farmers in Brazil. Uh, and Mr. Ngoc uh, is very humble, but he is piloting one on coffee, Vietnam, the coffee farmers. Um, I'm not uh, especially a geek, but uh, we are looking at this. And uh, on top of, you know, the physical presential discussion between farmers, we're starting to see farmers sharing pictures, ideas. Uh, I think this will help to, to speed up, you know, and, and to scale up faster than the one-to-one -one and, the, you know, the, the, the peer to peer discussion by groups of, of 20. And I, I start seeing the same in, in Brazil where we have it in Mexico. We start seeing farmers sharing, okay, always the same, but uh, sharing pictures, sharing ideas, sharing comments. I think this this can help. And I'm really looking forward to, you know, to widening uh, the expansion of this platform. Mm -hmm. Ian Gok, if you want to comment, feel free. Thanks so much indeed. Ian, do you want to talk a bit about um, peer to peer? Um, yeah, I think I'd back up the comments that have already been made, really. Um, I mean, as an industry, I think farmers are great at sharing. Um, that if, if we if I have any questions or any um, want to find out anything, it, I don't have to look very far to find somebody who's doing it. And it'd be very rare that that person wouldn't be willing to share what they're doing. There's no there's no secret between farms, even sort of next door neighbor farms. You know, we're not really in competition with each other as such. So uh, I would absolutely back up what Philippe has already said that, you know, we don't need to over engineer it, whatever format it is, whatever whatever route, whether it's Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, you know, there's plenty of opportunities out there. Those that are most interested will seek out the one that best suits them. You know, for us in the UK, there's events like Groundswell that we can go to. Um, you know, you, you don't have to look very far to find somebody who's already doing some of these who might be further down the, um, yeah, the, the journey than, than you are already. And, and they're more than willing to share their experiences. The, the key bit then, for me from peer-to-peer -peer learning is to is to learn what others are doing and then have some mechanism of then e exploring how that works on farm yourself because 
what might be a challenge to a farm for me, even in sort of the small British Isles, a farm in the West Midlands might be completely different to the challenges that I'm facing, you know, the differences in soil type. So the things that they're carrying out might work for them, but might not work for me. And then it's only by trying those on farm that we can find those out. So yeah, that's only, the, the peer to peer learning is important. It's only sort of part of the step really. Great, no, thank you. And then let's turn to the final point, the um, economic case uh, for regenerative agriculture the culture being made more compelling, particularly in the short term, in that initial part of the transition. Stefania, you mentioned it initially. Do you have any further points to make on you know, how we can make that uh, economic case compelling from the start? Thank you for asking again. I think this is a very a key component to scale. I was, I was saying, I just want to stress this, we have several studies now that prove that there is a positive long-term economic case uh, and that what we're really looking to should focus on how do we de-risk the short term and this first period of the of, of the transition. What 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 from this first study and survey where we surveyed over 120 farmers in Kansas in wheat. So it is you know agriculture is place specific. So I just want to say this as a caveat. We have seen there is first of all also the biggest need is a lack of coordination. Today there is not a a, a, a comprehensive financial mechanism that actually where farmers can go to a one coordination that's and say hey here these are all the financial instruments that you could use to support in the transition so there is also an overhaul of information for a farmer a farmer cannot possibly alone figure out the many emerging financial instruments that are out there so what i would say one of the first biggest needs that we have seen through this study has been a, a need for a coordinated action so a coordinated financing pathway and and because we have seen when when researching we have seen that there are today emerging financial instruments that are supporting um supporting farmers but but not enough and and so this is why uh yes this is why we are actually calling for a collaboration across uh ag banks insurance banks off takers that actually try to actually uh, how can we package a finance a financial uh, a financial support mechanism that can really de-risk the first years and support the farmers and would love to know uh, what our fellow panelists here like think about this as they have had experience and discussion with farmers yes i, I would love to hear as well from our fellow panelists of what they think of this so so philippe uh, what's your view on this what is it what makes the economic case more compelling in the short term? I mean, I think short term is a crucial thing here, right? Like um, the issue that I'm seeing is that farmers right now are mostly being paid for the yield that they're having, but that's it. They're not being paid for ecosystem services, which they would be providing. And I think carbon is the one where we're slowly starting to see a movement, but there's also biodiversity and soil water storage capacity, especially. For example, in, in my hometown in uh, Western Germany, and in the Netherlands, we had two years ago, we had massive floodings with 3.3 billion euros of damages. These floodings would not have occurred to that same level if we would have held these soils, which would be able to soak up the water. So in my opinion, government should be paying for farmers and for the ecosystem services. I would love to see the common agricultural policy moving in that direction. And that's a lot of the lobbying work that we're doing with climate farmers, that we have a government subsidy system, which is rewarding farmers for regeneration and for ecosystem services. At the same time, a topic that I'm very excited about is nutrient density from regenerative agriculture. And I think that's where I see corporates especially coming in. There is this kind of uh, industry thing in the air of premium prices being a bit of a taboo topic. And nobody wants to talk, uh, nobody wants to pay premium prices. I know that Nestle is doing something in that direction, which is good already, because I think it should be totally fine and okay to pay premium prices for premium products. And there is already studies out uh, from Europe and from America that show that regenerative produce has higher nutrient density. And I do believe that people have generally an interest in buying healthy food. Um, we're doing some pilot projects with the baby food producer, for example. And I can totally imagine that consumers are willing to pay a premium price for a product which is healthier and higher nutrient dense. And that means that that premium price should be passed on forwards to the farmer, which is producing the higher nutrient dense food. And if that would be happening, we would again see a shift towards regenerative agriculture because the economical case for regenerative agriculture would finally be where it should be. Great, no, thanks for that. Uh, Ian, you briefly, um, if you would, uh, any further thoughts for you and what makes the economic case in the short term more compelling and what, what kind of, what are the solutions there? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, as Stefania Stefania's already said, you know, the, there is a good economic case for the long term. It's just that transition period and how long that transition is actually going to take. And so uh, in the UK, we our support system is moving more towards um, sort of focus on soil, so away from um, an area based payment and more towards practices which will improve the soil health, which I think is a fantastic start. Um, I've also been involved for the last three years with the Nestle Wheat Plan, which in the UK is um, is carried out through the, the Landscape Enterprise Network Scheme, which is helping farmers, helping fund activities on farm, um, which will go towards regenerative practices. And, and for me, that's been a fantastic way to, as I said at the start, sort of accelerate our change. So it's not it's not driven us to do something different, but it's it's helped us to do things on scales which we wouldn't have otherwise have done because the, I I feel I'm sharing some of that risk, and that's what we talked about right at the start. You know, how do we how do we share that risk? Well, for me, that, that is a perfect way for me to be able to share my risk because it's not covering. There will be some sort of some big uh, financial impacts if we get it wrong, uh, and the weather might be the reason why we get it wrong. And it's not going to cover all that, but it's going to help give me some confidence that, to do some of the things that I was already looking to do. So the you know, partnerships like that, I think, are a great opportunity to, to, to help drive some of this change on farm. Yeah, I was, Pascal, I wanted to come back to you on this. Uh, what's your view on the uh, point around shifting uh, the risk from the farmers? It's come out a little bit in the, in the panel discussion here. If this transition is going to be successful, there needs to be a greater sharing of the risk and taking away from the farmers. Um, so that it's not just the young farmers or the desperate farmers that are feeling that this is something that they need to engage on. Yeah, look, um, I'm, I'm, we are all behind. I think I said it at the beginning. If there is not, if there is no benefit for the farmer, nothing will happen. You know, a transition means a change. A change means a risk. And nobody can afford to lose 20% of his income during one year. So that's it's that simple uh, to me. So uh, this is why, uh, as I said, so we are exploring different mechanisms. Uh, one is price premium, so price incentives. So if we get this practice and this outcome, uh, Nestle pays pay X cents per liter uh, on on top of of the, the, the base price. Um, we also invest, help with upfront investments, um, biologesters, uh, barn increase, improvement, the milking machine, uh, direct direct feeding machine. You know, uh, when you, you, you move from, uh, you know, um, classical plowing to uh, minimum tillage and cover crop and so on. So it requires some specific machinery. So there we help uh, farmers with the upfront uh, investments. Doesn't mean that we finance 100% of the cost, but uh, we finance part of it, and then we find we need to find a local uh, partner to to you know to to come with a, a good loan, good interest. So there are plenty of um, financial mechanism. Um, it has to be local by by design, by by, by definition almost. I don't think we have explored everything. There is still a lot a lot to do. Um, biology, I, I, I was quoting biologists, uh, for instance, it brings a lot of uh, carbon improvements, but it's a significant upfront investment for a farmer with a, with a low, uh, you know, immediate return. That's, that's a bit tricky. And when it comes to the change of practices, uh, Jan knows much better than I do. Uh, there is a risk and uh, there might be a risk for uh, a few years. Uh, until uh, the farmer uh, adjusts, uh, you know, adapts the practice to that field uh, in a different different way to the other one. Um, I think during that period, farmers need to be a company, or at least the risk to be mitigated, so, so that the risk is uh, the risk is shared. Now there are also lots of uh, uh, good stories. Uh, we've been extremely careful with that. We've never pushed anything on farmers to avoid uh, failures. Uh, till now, I'm not aware of any failure, so cross fingers. Um, but it takes more time because it takes the time of the piloting, the trying, and then expanding. And I think if you want to go too fast, that 
could create damages. And I would just like to, to conclude by quoting uh, some, you know, some practices are almost no brainer, like uh, cover crop, but intercropping, you know, in coffee, and Gork mentioned it, but uh, through the increase of, uh, you know, intercropping, inter intercropping with uh, cash crops, uh, fruit trees, uh, things like that. You know, in Philippines, we have checked that farmers income has increased by 40% uh, thanks to the intercropping. So this is the perfect case. You know, you, you increase farmers income, you diversify the farmer income and you protect the soil and you create biomass you know, that will enrich, you know, the, the soil if you use legume in between the coffee rows. So if you take the time and the appropriate technical support, uh, that can be a very nice story as well. But you need to bring the, the right expertise and take the time. Thank, thanks, um, Pascal. One, one final follow-up question for me before we get to the uh, Q&A. And thanks very much for the questions. We have over 100 questions now. Um, a lot of chat um, about uh, if from the dairy sector about uh, the role of the dairy sector in producing methane. How are uh, Nestle's greenhouse gas plans addressing methane from the dairy sector in particular? Uh, well, yeah, that's a big topic. How do we address it? Uh, we address it seriously. Uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question because uh, we keep talking about carbon and CO2 very often, but in agriculture, CO2 is not the major culprit. Indeed, methane and uh, you know, into a nitrous oxide uh, are, are, are bigger culprits uh, very often. And in dairy, methane is a key one. Uh, we address it, I, I just said it before, uh, biodigester. So we finance a lot of biodigester projects uh, with uh, upfront support uh, to farmers. Uh, we have, for instance, a very big, uh, nice project with vermiculture in US that we are uh, about to expand uh, seriously. Um, and that can be project of any size. There, there's one which I, I was, I love, I was in India two months ago and I visited a small holder where, a very small holder, the, the, the family had five, 10 cows. And uh, we financed this very small scale biodigester. And then with the methane, the gas produced, uh, the family can cook. So on one side, you improve you know, the greenhouse gas emission. And on the other side, you provide a very good help to, you know, for cooking. And the lady was super happy because with the time saved to cook, she was able to have more cows and produce more milk and improve their revenue. So that, that, that's the kind of thing which, uh, you know, we, we promote. And you know, again, about methane, we have lots of projects on manure management, you know, it's not necessarily a biodigester. We, we help with, you know, separation, liquid, solid manure, uh, lots of projects as well on feed because methane comes a lot from enteric fermentation. So feed efficiency is extremely important. We work also on increasing, uh, you know, the, the, the lifetime of a milking cow. You know, if you increase the lifetime of a milking cow by one or two years, you save a lot of methane emission. Uh, what else? And we have a lot of, um, yeah, what mentioning a research project on uh, feed additive and feed efficiency to improve the, the, you know, the rumination efficiency. So methane is definitely very high, very, very high on the agenda when it comes to dairy regenerative agriculture. Great, okay, well, thanks, thanks, Pascal. Right, let's get to the questions. Uh, it's maybe worth reminding everybody that the Nestle team have been furiously answering some of the questions behind the scenes. I see there are already 31 replies. So do go onto the Q&A box, you can see um, all the answers that the Nestle team have already been given to your questions. So I'd like to bring back in the team from Vietnam and from Chile. So welcome back to you. I'm gonna put a question to you, uh, Mr. Nock, about uh, Vietnam. So question asks, why did farmers lose trust in existing sustainable coffee development programs? And what is it that you're doing differently to address that? So why did they lose trust? And then what are you doing differently? Brief response if you wouldn't mind. We've got quite a lot of questions and not much time, but thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. Actually, you see, um, long time ago, <clears throat> we have made a support program from um, the Euro, from the United States especially to the, the poor country like Vietnam before. 
So that's why um, normally the project may be last long for three or maximum five years. Then they also focus on the coffee, uh, sustainable coffee development program. But the problem is, you see, that's why they focus only on the, the buses have been approved, that they carry out the activity uh, and support the farmer, but not yet to make the connection for the whole coffee value chain. So that's why sometimes the farmer already receives some support. But after the project, after three years, everything back to the normal situation. So that's why when we carry out a network plan in Vietnam and they believe maybe we do the same. And they 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 not trust, you see. There is a uh, let's see what happened for network plan in Vietnam. So that's why when we carry out the uh, the baseline survey, and we know that the, the farmer normally they they would like to focus on the profit. If the program uh, can increase their uh, income, their livelihood, so they go for. Otherwise, you say they will say goodbye to, to us. So that's why when we carry out the method of plan, we uh, we very be careful uh, to uh, make the daily survey, uh, survey and also to to make the um, the training data segment to see how the farmer what it needs and also how to do differently. Then uh, before you say normally when we started the program, normally we would a lot of uh, uh, budget to, to support the farmer to build up the demo plot and so on. But when we carry out a network plan, actually we do the different in the different way. Well, firstly, we made a survey and then you know that uh, some farmer, they already very good uh, in the privacy and they can, can handle so well and they can make very good profit already. So that's why we are using that farmer and we explain uh, scientifically what they are, what is the practice already goes and what is not good. And they, we, we can together to develop the program and improve. Then we use in that farmer become the reference farm or the most not farm. And we carry out the, the, the training direct on that farm. Then after you see the farmer, they, they do the training and we invite the other farmer to uh, carry out the study to, to the farmer, to that farm, and they can share the experience, but because you see normally when the farmer, they uh, they uh, listen something, they receive some knowledge, but they not believe. But when the farmer, the real farmer, the bad practice farmer, transfer the knowledge, so they, they completely uh, very convincing them to follow. So that also the, the, the reason why we, we can start the program until now, already 12 years and more than 21,000 farmer still together with us. And even uh, last time Bascam visited the farmer, even they would like to, to join more to expand the, the, the program in the future. Then last but not least, you can say that uh, when we're talking about a real different culture, normally the farmer, they also very practical. Uh, they, they said you uh, talk too much academic, so that's why we have to transfer the, the academic knowledge to the simplified farmer language. So that's why, uh, like you can see on on, on my, my presentation, we got uh, 17 different uh, reactive area culture practices. But when we transfer to the farmer, we focus only on three main groups. Then in this case, you see, we simplify the knowledge and we, the farmer know how to improve the soil uh, and how to work the soil uh, conservation, water conservation, and also biodiversity. And when we're talking about IOSC, we focus more on the agroforestry model. Like uh, Bhaskar already mentioned, the good uh, symbol in India. And recently we also visit, and we, I think that is a good model for the future. Then also we continue to support the farmer to identify the, the back uh, intercrop. Three can be intercropping with uh, coffee to increase the farm income. It's starting in the same uh, uh, piece of land. But the farmer receive more income than they will stay with us. Then uh, last but not least, you see when we are talking about the agroforestry and also biodiversity, so that means we already support the farmer to reduce the carbon footprint, and uh, <clears throat> we will provide the, all the funding from the current practice from farmer. Thanks. No. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. I'd like to put a question to the Chile team now. Um, are you, there's a question coming in, are you working on reducing the impact of nitrogen fertilizers and emissions on your grasslands? 
Yes, and indeed, it, we're working on that. And um, through the biofertilizers project um, uh, that it's been applied for, we we'll, we nowadays have um, 279 producers that are working on different projects on region X. So uh, on that matter, not everyone is biofertilizing, but we've done been going through this journey since 2021 when we launched our Region X strategy. So biofertilizers is the key uh, uh, for um, nitrogen. And uh, okay. we're replacing synthetic fertilizers as urea. And uh, uh, also I would quick quick uh, uh, call to, to an economic impact also that brings together with uh, using, um, substituting the synthetic fertilizers using biofertilizer because it's a much less cost than urea. That's what we use here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, the next one of the questions, um, I'm going to put them to a, to a specific panelist. And if anyone wants, want, else wants to make a quick comment, then please just raise your hand. Um, question that's at the top of our ranking on uh, from the audience is uh, how to measure, report, and verify the outcomes of regenerative uh, agriculture examples um, that we've talked about. So, how do we do this best, um, Stefania? I don't know if that's one. If that's one for you, just again a brief response, if you can, please. Yes, for sure. The for the the briefest uh, answer that I can give is please join us because in WBC <laughs> we have set up a working group that is working on this, and uh, and how to to best measure it. If if not, there there is another element I can say is there is today scientific evidence on on the benefits and on the best indicators that are the most relevant from a science point of view. So I, we can out, we flag maybe some publications that could be relevant for the audience to look into and uh, and but th this is I, I just want to outline that we, we are there are some challenges there is one is the challenge of alignment that we can solve as humans then there is a challenge that Ian was also mentioning which is on data traceability and collection and the cost of collection and where an innovation is also needed to actually make this cost effective so uh, there is, this is a long path we have started we're starting on this journey and so we're not going to solve this uh, overnight unfortunately. Thank you. A, a heroic plug for the World Business Council there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, uh, main drivers for Nestle in applying regenerative agriculture is the next question. Pascal, what, very briefly, just what are the business drivers for you here? Just the top line headline there. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. The business driver, you mean, or, or, or the general why? Yeah, the main drivers for the business case in regenerative agriculture, just the kind of key business case drivers for you. I think I said it at the beginning, you know, everything we sell is food comes from a farmer at one point. We want, we need to make sure that we secure, it's about ensuring supply at one point, I think. And uh, yeah, we, we need to take care of the upstream sourcing. Now, if, if the question behind is, uh, how do we communicate to consumers? This is a, this is not an easy answer. It's a good question, but it's not an easy answer. Today, regenerative agriculture is not known by consumers. Let's face it. Uh, there is a lot of uh, education to be done. Uh, there is a lot of um, confusion with organic and not entering into the debate that one is better than the other. I will never do that. Um, but I think, yeah, this is the, this is the case. Uh, today, so we, we try security. to explain it's corporate, yeah. Yeah, so supply and security, I guess, is ultimately the, 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 a key part of it. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, right, social aspects of regenerative agriculture. This has been high up the, um, the, the upvotes for much of the, the webinar. Uh, Philippe, I wonder if you might want to comment on this. So what are the key social aspects of regenerative agriculture and, and how are incomes protected? In your view, I know we're talking about Europe, but but in that context, what are yours? What's your view on that? You specify what you mean with social aspects. As to what the well, I guess and best farmer income is, is the one that's that's, that's our question or references. So let's go with that. I mean, essentially, this we already touched up on this, right? The issue that we have right now is that farmer income is mainly coming from yield of the farm, but not from payment for the ecosystem services which farmers are having, and not. From the quality of the produce in terms of nutrient density and i think this is the two key levers um, that we need to enable 
because this is the benefits that we're having from regenerative agriculture. And essentially, we need to be moving, as I believe, overall into an economy which has true cost accounting, where we actually reward people for type benefits or outcomes which are beneficial for society and not just for economical benefits, which is what we're doing at the moment. Thanks, uh, Stefania, you reach your hand. Yeah, sorry, and if I just may add quickly what, what is important, when we're looking at the long-term positive economic case um, uh, for farmers, the, the studies that I was mentioning to you, we actually did not include ecosystem services because this is still conditional. And uh, and uh, I just love the quote that a U.S. farmer said, for me, uh, carbon credits are a juice that it's not worth the squeeze. Um, so, uh, are an orange that is not worth the squeeze. So, but, but, but just to relate on that, I just wanted to flag that uh, on the economic case for regenerative agriculture, we're also looking at the reduction of the use of inputs uh, and, and water being also one. And so we're actually we're, we're looking at an economic case that is uh, meant maintain, maintaining the yield, but also then reducing the use of inputs. And, and so this is this also comes with higher margins uh, in the in, in the long term for, for farmers. And so this is why it has been positively shown. And you can look at some of the uh, I hope I hope I, I posted it in the right chat, but you can see some of the graphs that, that show that. And I think Ian wanted to comment next. Yeah, and I'm going to ask you a different question, though. So it's a related question, Ian, if you don't mind. Um, it's also a question around, um, around kind of financially finance related. And the question asks about increasing investments in keeping growing uh, regenerative agriculture practices or, or keeping the necess necessity for continual investment. Do you think that there is there going to be a continual investment required for some time and when will it all when will regenerative practices pay for themselves uh ian for you and it relates to the farmer income i think yeah just to quickly sort of focus on the last bit of the question um i wish i knew um and that's the beauty of it and that's that's what i said right at the start we don't know the transition period how long it's going to take but i think for me you know we, we see big fluctuations in our income um largely based around weather uh, uh and, and therefore yields um and if i want to try and improve my profitability there's only two ways of doing it it's only by raising yields or by reducing our unit cost of production by whilst maintaining our yield um and so for us the the key bit is we've been in a high in uh, you know high input high output system uh, and in a sense that's sort of breaking down now um because we're losing the we're losing the some of the inputs we're losing the effectiveness of the inputs so the only way really is to focus on reducing our unit cost of production without seeing our yield slipping too much and that's where i believe the, the the sort of regenerative practices that we are involved in is is has got to be has got to help in that respect because you know hopefully by using things like cover crops by introducing more legumes into rotation we can build the facility in the soil and we can reduce you know we can cut back on some of our most expensive inputs we paid over 800 pounds a ton for fertilizer for nitrogen fertilizer last year you know that makes a, a, a big impact on our um uh on the costs of, of growing crops um and also as i said a large a large reason for the fluctuations is, is down to weather uh and if we can make soils more resilient then hopefully we can take out some of those fluctuations which isn't necessarily always going to sort of increase our bottom line but certainly sort of knock off some of the the most detrimental to the bottom line um and it's a lot of it sounds that the hardest thing i find with with regen as a term is is in theory it sounds fantastic you know why wouldn't anyone want to do all this it, it's the putting it into practice which is the hardest bit obviously and, and that's the bit that we've got to put the, our, our faith in those that have done it tried it further down the line than us that, that there will be some endpoint because yeah we, we want we need to get there but we just don't know how long it's going to take okay thank you um but a question about um quite a lot of questions seem to be talk, thinking about again back to the risk and mitigating the risk uh, point um and specifically uh risks around uh, missing i guess in an early stage missing quality parameters for for um when you're moving to a different approach Pascal, I wonder if you wanted, wanted to comment on that briefly. What's Nessie's approach to, you know, working with farmers, making them move to a tra transition to more regenerative uh, practices, but ensuring that they don't have impacts on quality in, in particular along the way? Uh, well, quality is 
at the core of everything, you know, in at Nestlé and the food company. Uh, so there is no negotiation at all on, on quality. I don't see, honestly, I don't see any major risk from, uh, you know, uh, regenerative practices so-called on, on, on quality. Um, there may be a risk in the change management process, which needs to be taken care of, uh, yeah. But I think the, the, the quality process that we have at Nestle, you know, uh, in, in the sourcing, you know, all the HACCP studies, all the quality monitoring team, all the analytical plans that we have, we apply that religiously uh, at every step of, you know, of the sourcing and of the, you know, the incoming of materials. So this is, this is absolutely, you know, strongly under uh, in the control. Yeah, uh, I would, uh, yeah, it's a given. Quality, uh, quality in food safety, it's a given. It has to. Okay, thank you. Um, question um, for for Natalie. Um, I wonder if uh, you can give a little bit of uh, thought on, or give us a bit of thinking on, on how long term regenerative practices have been taking. Uh, how sorry, how long regenerative practices have been occurring in Chile, and, and how they are captured in your programs. Again, briefly, if you would. Again, we're getting short of time. Well, I mentioned something at the introduction. So we, uh, some of the practices that dairy, grazing dairy farms use are manure, manure fertilization with manure. Um, how long it has been used? It's it's a common practice in in grazing dairy farms. So I I can't give you a date for that, but it's it's very common. Um, other uh, aspects of regenerative agriculture that we are. You, uh, also working as a research institution together with Nestle on the dairy farms that we are intervening are um, um, and, and are related to regenerative agriculture are looking at the different sources of a uh, high carbon footprint, looking at high sources of greenhouse gas emissions and implementing uh, management practices to reduce this. For example, replacing protein sources in the diet Protein sources that are coming from far away, let's say from another country that have a high carbon footprint and replacing them for local protein sources such as, such as our own uh, grains that we produce here in, in Chile. Um, that would be one, one key aspect. And uh, the other um, key aspect is um, the, uh, reduction, the, 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 the reduction of chemical fertilization. Uh, Gabriel mentioned it's a high cost uh, input in the dairy system, so it's uh, it's it needs to be balanced, and we are uh, supporting the the farms that are on the net zero program to balance better the fertilization using manure and very little chemical fertilization. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we're just have time for one, perhaps maybe two quick final uh, questions. A lot of questions are leading to smallholder farmers and engaging with smallholder farmers on regenerative agricultural products, uh, uh, agri regenerative agricultural initiatives, rather. Um, I wonder if anybody would like to comment on some of the challenges there, what's sp specifically required. Stefani, have you any thoughts on smallholders in particular? No, I think I, I would defer to the Nestle team who has extensive experience there as um, I, I don't have any uh, learnings top of mind to share there, but I know sure. there is, of course, a, a challenge in size of the farmer engagement. Sure. Pascal, perhaps you can yeah, jump in. A, a quick one. I think here with smallholders, the key here is to help them, it's professionalization, and help them grow, and help them grow their farm as a business so that they really make a living out of, out of their farm and uh, yeah so we it's a different approach i think there it's more about professionalization technical support financial support to help them grow uh, and sustainability will come as a collateral benefit i i rather see it that way and the challenge there is probably more the the number uh, because to support one farmer, you need, uh, you know, you need a, a given number of uh, hours and it's proportional to the number of farmers. So the challenge, I think there is more, uh, is more, lies more on that side. Okay, um, we have run out of time. Um, I did say to all the panelists that it'll go very quickly and indeed it has. 
It's been a really fabulous uh, 90 minutes. Totally enjoyed all the conversations we've had uh, with everybody here and also with all your questions. Thanks so much indeed. Uh, with a lot of people on the call, um, and I hope it's been interesting for you. Let me just remind everybody in closing uh, of the Nestle commitments that we've been talking about in regenerative agriculture, sourcing 20% of its key ingredients from regenerative agriculture by 2025 and 50% by 2030. Um, and as I said, the company is now beginning to report on these. Now, if you want more information on that, let me point you in the direction of Nestle's Creating Shared Value and Sustainability Report, which came out in March um, for a, a broad overview on the regenerative agriculture process, progress, um, but also on climate change uh, and more broadly. Um, in addition, uh, you may be, be interested to know that the Nestle Institute of Agricultural Sciences is going to be inaugurated on May the 3rd next week. So thanks to our, all the Nestle team for their openness to show progress uh, in the field from around the world, we've heard from Southeast Asia, we've heard from Latin America and from Europe today. As I said right at the, tar the start of the session, the webinar recording will be emailed to everybody who registered um, and so you can forward it on to your colleagues for able to listen to it at their leisure and for you as well. And it'll, it'll come out in the Innovation Forum podcast and be published on our website. But that's it for now. Thanks so much for joining us and goodbye.